Hi, it's me, Joe List. I'm here to soothe your tits and touch your dink. Welcome back to the greatest podcast ever invented by man or woman or animal. It's Mindful Metal Jacket. How have you been? I went on hiatus for about, I don't know, three years or something like that. No idea. Now, truth be told, I already recorded an intro for the first episode back. Then I recorded an episode with my friend Luke Monas that was so good, we're bumping him to the front of the line. So apologies to my dear friend, the wonderful Andrew Chavone, who is now episode two back, because he was defeated by the great Luke Monas. I'm kidding, of course. It's not a competition, but this episode you're about to listen to or watch, whatever it is, I hope you watch it because Luke is a beautiful hunk of a man. And I'm also in it. It's uh, one of the best episodes I've done in a long time. I haven't recorded that many. we got a whole bunch of episodes coming out. Thanks for sticking around. So many people have written nice messages saying they miss the podcast. They love the podcast. It means so much to them. It's um, one of the best things I've ever done in my career. I'm sorry I was on a break for so long, but I was doing other things. Now it's back, and I hope you come back with the podcast. If you're listening, you are back. And the best thing you can do for any podcast is tell some friends. You say, hey, you got to check out this podcast. If you're new to the podcast, there are a ton of old episodes. Sam Morill, Stavros Halkius, some other assholes. Go check those out. There's a whole backlog. But first, stay right there. Don't touch that dial. Is there still a dial? I don't think so. Dial soap. Dial my phone number. Oh, I hope I die a little... Um, this episode is Luke Monas, dear friend of mine, uh, who I kind of knew when he lived in New York. And then uh, we talked about this. We, we did a, um, we talked about it on the pod. I mean, we did a TV show in, in London, hit it off big time. He's been opening for me on the road. If you've come to the shows in Spokane or, um, Salt Lake City or Tempe, you might've saw Luke. You did see Luke. And um, we have a great conversation. We joke around for a little bit up front. There's a lot of laughs, a lot of, a lot of you know, queefing up front. And then we really get into our parents, our upbringing, neurosis, anxiety, panic, all that stuff. It became a really solid, just in-depth conversation. We did it at the Hotel Ziggy in West Hollywood. And uh, shout out to my pal, uh, Mitchell, for shooting this, who's a beautiful man. We're going to reference how attractive he is several times. He's a 20-year-old boy that was in my hotel room, one-on-one -on -one in West Hollywood. And, uh, oh, here comes Sarah. Here comes Sarah and Katie. Hi. I'm just recording a quick intro for my podcast. Oh, it's Julia and Katie. What a special day. Sorry we're in your bedroom. Are we in the intro? Yeah, you're in the intro. That's Julia Johns and Katie Hannigan. This is the new Mindful Metal Jacket, episode one, Luke Monis. I'm bringing it back, baby. Past guest, Katie Hannigan. Got to get Julia on. Anyways, here it is. A hot new episode with my friend, the hilarious Luke Bonus. Go check out Luke wherever he is, whatever. He's tall. He's handsome. He's funny. And we kissed. And anyways, oh yeah, it was recorded in West Hollywood, Hotel Ziggy. We're back. And remember, be kind to yourself. Be kind to me. Subscribe, comment, like, tell a friend, and enjoy this conversation with myself and Luke Bonus. Mindful Metal Jacket is brought to you by BetterHelp. I love BetterHelp. You, you know me. I'm a therapy guy. Every single episode we talk about therapy on here, therapy has changed my life, and it can change your life, too, whether you're dealing with difficult decision in your career or relationship or any other areas of life. You know what, you know what therapy is all about. Therapy is necessary. I think legally everybody should have to go to therapy. And now it is much easier. BetterHelp's online therapy helps you figure out what you want out of life so you can take the reins and be in charge of your future. Don't you want to be in charge of your future, folks? You certainly do. To get matched with a therapist, you fill out their online questionnaire. BetterHelp is totally online so you can meet wherever and whenever it's convenient for you. I've sent this to my niece, to family members. They've all used it. Of course, I have Alan. You know about Alan. I'm lucky. I got in there, and he's booked solid. You can't even get in with him. So the best way to get a therapist is go to Better Help. It's nice, low-key, easy, and affordable. And there's none of that stigma. You, you don't need any of that stigma crap that people, I don't know, I don't know where that came from. 
I'm all therapy all the way. So go get to it. You don't have to feel overwhelmed all the time. Talk with a licensed therapist to get clarity about the past and hope for what's to come. Let therapy be your map with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash metal today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash metal. Betterhelp.com slash metal. Get yourself a nice deal on therapy. You will never regret it. No one ever says, boy, I'm really bummed I went to therapy. It won't happen. Look at this tall cup of jizz here. Oh, here we go. I mean, you look fantastic. Thank New you. haircut. I feel so good every time I uh, every time you enter a room I'm in. You, you shower me with compliments. I'm sitting in like a lobby and I, I just the elevator dings open and I hear, Oh my god, look at that beautiful man. Good God, what, what the hell did you do the last two hours? Well, you're very attractive. And by the way, Mitch, what a beautiful boy this yeah, guy is. I mean, we got a looks like this guy looks like uh, Jonathan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> It's something I'm surrounded by <laughs> hunks here. Yeah, you're, you're a good-looking guy. I don't want you to... uh, oh, stop it. The teeth, the forehead, the, <laughs> the herpes, everything. It's really a nightmare. But um, we're here uh, in uh, fabulous Hollywood, California. Yeah, this and, is really it here, huh? Yeah, we're at the Hotel Ziggy. This is like the rock and roll hotel. I think this is the cool hotel now. I was thinking that when I was in the lobby. I You know, because people say rock and roll hotel, but like there is like instruments and like rock music stuff and yeah there's they're really going for it music contracts they have musicians playing in it last time i was here there was a stand-up comedy show in that room and uh i was robert kelly and i and we walked upstairs and they were getting ready and they tried to bark us in we were both were a little bit hurt that neither one recognized us neither rec neither spotted neither clocked no todd barry had a great line one time he said uh he was outside the cellar and they tried to bark him into the show and he goes i don't say this often but you should know who I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, listen, we don't have to dwell on it. These are peers. They're fellow comedians, but that's a huge uh, a huge error. Yeah, it's tough. By the way, I drove by. I'm in L.A. here, and uh, I talk about frequently the kooks, the street, street toughs. Sure. We drove around Hollywood. My God, Hollywood's seen some better days. Certainly has. I mean, uh, I do like that. That Grauman's theater area, though, I, I for some reason I like that the, the Spider Man and the Iron Man and seeing the. <laughs> I mean, I like a film, obviously, but yeah. uh, it's a little intense, I'll... pun intended. <laughs> I mean, it's wild. Just ten cities right on sunset. Yeah. How about over here? Not so bad over here, but we did. Um... You're not really in a walkable area. No, it's not that bad. No. If okay. you go uh, west from here, the Sunset Strip is right there. You can walk. There's a Starbucks five minutes away. I was going to ask, how close is your nearest uh, Bucks? Close enough. I mean, I jogged the first time just to feel it out. Yeah. I like to run in case there's trouble. I'm already running. Yeah, sure. Uh, but once I got the coffee, I was like, I think I'm okay. So there's a Starbucks nearby. You know all my uh, intricacies. Let's let's just dive in here. Let's dive in. I love it. Now, because I'm you here. have to deal with me. I'm a mental patient. You've been, we've been doing some dates together. <laughs> Absolutely. And we really just hit it off. <laughs> we really did. So we're really gelling as a team. It's completely. And I appreciate people, you know, accepting my, uh, what do you call? Call them picadillos. Is yeah, picadillos. I mean, oh, I'm really glad you used that word, picadillos. A fun word. Picadillo sounds like a like a pepper. It does. It? it sounds like a little pepper you'd put on a sandwich. I think it actually might be. Is that right? I think. Uh, well, and then there's Piccadilly Circus. Sure, in London, where we we really we really hit it off. Yeah. Now, uh, I think you know one of the re one of the reasons maybe I jo uh, gel with your Piccadillos, which sounds like such a crazy <laughs> sentence, is because I think I've always felt like people have to deal with mine, but yours are to such a degree more extreme than me that it makes me feel like Cool Hand Luke. I mean, I feel cool as a cucumber. You are Luke. You're Cool Hand Luke. But also, let's not make it sound like I'm a psycho. I don't have to tap three times and touch a crack or whatever. I just need to go to Starbucks eight to nine times a day. But I got into it. I mean, I was getting coffee and I was all, all jacked up on caffeine. And you, but I mean, ultimately, of all of the compulsions to have, you have like very mild, pleasant compulsions. Like I appreciate people it. People have. I mean, there's that class. I think we talked about this, but there's that classic like OCD thing of like. I got to go back and check the oven or I got to go back and make sure that the um, 
door is completely locked right but yours are more like it's 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 stuff that totally doesn't intrude on anyone else's day even the people close to you and around you we got to clip this and send it to my wife because she <laughs> thinks i'm a great big nightmare but yeah i like i, I you know i can't I oversteep my tea i gotta take the cup out and get rid of the tea bags pretty quickly i like to get yeah. an evening brownie you yeah. know but That's nothing crazy thinking. i mean how much you, you got you got the ocd but it's like brownie <laughs> You got brownie OCD. You're well, like, I need a brownie. It's like, well, I mean, this guy's fine by me. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah, people are like, oh, you're crazy. It's like, I'm sorry, the guy likes a, a warmed brownie in the oven at Starbucks. <laughs> I've seen worse. How about, can we just talk about, we'll get into some real stuff here. We're, yeah. we're here to serve. We try to help the people at home. Absolutely. But how would you describe... Uh, to Mitch and the folks at home, Mitch. the Starbucks barista in Tempe, Arizona, that we met. Well, first of all, you, you come in with you come in with great energy to a new Starbucks. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I feel like you appreciate me more than my wife does. I mean, I really, I'm not so annoying. I got I got great energy. Yeah, we should have a kid. Um, <laughs> it would be a beautiful, tall man. Certainly, would kind of look like Mitch, frankly, for being honest. <laughs> Mitch, we we're going to adopt you. Um, <laughs> no, but you come in, you got great energy, and you're you're like you know pointing at people, you're saying hello. I'm kind of I'm kind of tagging along. I'm in the rear. I'm I'm cleaning up the mess behind you. Yeah, and then this, you're goose. Yeah, I really am. And we get to the front, we order the drinks, and then you do what I what is literally like you give them a you spin and then give them the finger gun. <laughs> which is like so many people i think to be perfectly honest again i like it i think it's great i is i've always wanted to be in a starbucks with that kind of energy but <laughs> but, but most people would be like who work who work at the starbucks and be like what the hell is this guy doing I mean, this guy just, and then you spin, you gave him the finger guns, and then you went, little, I gave you a little spin there. And then, and then he, let's be, let's be crystal clear about what happened. He then did a full spin and then did what I believe is called a death drop. Oh, I, I don't, I, I don't know the it's term. A, it's a, it's a, a dance term or something. He went full splits and splits on the ground and leaned back like full Cirque du Soleil. And, and it was more than a 360. He did like a 720. Well, that was the thing. He did. I think he did 720. He was like Tony Hawk. <laughs> Tony Hawk's pro skater out there is pretty crazy. It was banana. I mean, uh, like he spun till I couldn't see him anymore. It was like a cartoon. He was like the Tasmanian devil. And then the next time we were in there, I think he was. I think he was walking on the ceiling. He was. He had his feet. He was doing the full blown. I'm glad he got the reference because he had his feet uh, on each counter yes i was like you're doing the full jean-claude van damme thing and he was mopping the ceiling it was wild he was like happy to have you back boys and it was just like wow this is unbelievable well i think we really could have taken him home and done what we wanted with this man he really was he was excited and i, I think yep. he suspected we were a couple I think and so i too. say that because we're two jolly men and i was never not dancing Never not dancing and never, frankly, I mean, we were we, we were never not shoulder to shoulder in the Starbucks. Yeah, and we were straight up flirting with them, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, it was a good time. That was a great time. <laughs> Legendary weekend out there at the Tempe. A lot of other stuff happened, too, we don't need to get into, but... Uh, do, you want, do you want to get into it? It was a memorable. No, 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 okay, we can't get right. into it. That's Come on, that's crazy. Yeah, you're right. That was a memorable weekend, we'll just say that. Okay. But anyway, so... I'm getting to know you. You seem well adjusted, a sweet, sweet boy. You went to sure. Columbia University. I did. Tell I the did. people about that. What is that like? I mean, <laughs> you have you you have such a great reaction to it. I mean, most people just kind of go. The thing I get when I say I went to Columbia is people go, "I'm glad you didn't do this too." Talk about just. I feel like we're, we got continual just first impression positivity here, but. I usually say I went to Columbia, and then comedians will go like, oh, mm. they give that noise. They go, oh, oh I've heard of it. Yeah, I yeah. Say I get, I've heard of it 90% of the time I say I went to Columbia. Right, yeah. But you went, you went to Columbia? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, I also spent some time there. As we discussed, I dated a That's young lady true. there. We went to the same gym. That's true. We talked about the underground gym at Columbia. I had a great time. I I started stand up there. I went to school in the in the Big Apple. I got a little uh, sticker pass that let me get into any art museum in the city for free. I had that also, even though you get the pass? it was well, I I just had the ID because of the uh, gym membership, so I didn't have the sticker pass. But I did have the ID that gets you into many many uh, 
places and I had to pretend I was a student even though I'm 58 years old <laughs> and I had it for a long time yeah well you could have been like uh, Columbia does this thing that they started after World War II called the School of General Studies where a lot of older people especially guys who are in the military come and they can like get a degree from Columbia obviously they have to get into the school they're not just right. like if you served in Iraq come on over but like <laughs> although they should Right? I mean, they shouldn't be giving them to me. They should give that guy a degree who went to Fallujah. Yeah, I suppose so, but you can't have, like, dum-dums in there. It's Columbia, for God's sake. Yeah, I guess that's true. They are men of letters over there and women of letters. And it's a, it's a proud, fine institution, and I'm happy to be associated with it. Although, now, sometimes I feel like I... It's, it's a, a lot of the people I went to college with are, you know, they're, they're really... They're movers and shakers. A buddy of mine is on the New York City Council. Wow. 30 years old. But you're doing stand-up comedy and quite successful. You're I'm on television. stand-up comedy. That's true. I'm on the CW, and nobody can ever take that away from me. Yeah, you're living in Hollywood. You must have done a late night. Have you done late nights? No late night. Wow. Why? I don't know. Yeah, that's... that's. Have you submitted? Oh, yeah. This I mean, is... Look, I don't know what to say. I, I no, I've, it, A couple of the times I submitted, and it was more of a thing of like... It just the timing didn't work because then I was going to go do like a Comedy Central set and I was just like, oh, we'll kick the can down the road. And right. Then COVID happened. And then now we're here. Wow. And now there's only one late night to do. What is it? Fallon. Wow. Are they all gone? I think so. I mean, I think, well, they're all gone right now because of the writer's strike. But I think that uh, Corden is gone. It no longer exists. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, Seth Meyers doesn't do stand up and Colbert doesn't really do stand up at all. Colbert Col will do a stand up. It's like a. He used it for a while, a bunch. Sarah did it. A lot of people did it. Yeah, and he did it like they did him in batches. Yeah, he's kind of an ass like that. They <laughs> did it. He wasn't even there. Right. He wouldn't even be in the room right. when it happened. You really got to not like stand up to be a talk show host and to be like, do it when I'm. At my house. Yeah, it's really obnoxious. By the way, not enough people. We we got to really. What if we just never talked on anything? <laughs> but we'll we'll dive into some stuff. We're gonna really help some people here. But not enough people talk about this. Sarah Talamash, my lovely wife, my pregnant wife, and I sure appeared on late night, totally randomly on the exact same night, filmed different days. Really? She filmed a week in advance. Colbert, whatever. And uh, the way, you know, he does it. Oh, you're going to be on tomorrow. No, yeah. next week. Ended up being the same night. I was on Conan. She was on Colbert. I had. Husband and wife. Totally separate. No idea. Is that wild? I mean, that's that's one of the craziest things I've ever heard. That, as you say, it reminds me, Conan also gone. Yeah, that's sad. Conan was the best. You're a great fit for Conan. I would have, I bet a million dollars you did a Conan. I would have had, I would have loved to, but I think it's just, you know, you forget I'm, I'm a, I, frankly, I'm a spring chicken. You're a young boy. <laughs> I'm, I'm a spring chicken and uh, it's my first year doing stand-up comedy and, uh, you know, I, all of these things that I, uh, I don't want to get too dark here, although I feel like this is the podcast to do it, but. We go dark, baby. All of these things that I saw, you know, you and your kind of, uh, generation of comics do and mm -hmm. aspired to do have uh crumbled before me like a sandcastle yeah that's really weird it's a weird thing i talk about this with comedy sometimes is people are like god this must be a big deal but you're like well i didn't dream of this like people are like netflix they yeah. talk about netflix but i'm like well netflix only existed in my 25th year of doing comedy you know what i mean it's like that's not anything i ever thrived for totally and i mean of course i i i wouldn't trade this for the world but well maybe maybe some maybe some worlds but um you know it's like not the it, things have changed so much since i started comedy that it's like you have to kind of constantly be part of it now is like you have to sort of be nimble and on your toes about like well what what should i do next and how do i how do i fit in yeah because you would be as someone who's like about to have a kid you like 20 or 30 years ago would be just doing a totally different thing in stand-up yeah, no, it's really weird. And I'm not good at adapting or no. I have had the worst instinct on everything ever. I mean, when Mark and I did our podcast, first of all, I was like, no ads. We're not doing ads. <laughs> We're like, I was trying to be like, you know, Bill Hicks was like, yeah. you, you know, you're going to be an artist. Yeah. And I was like, that's ridiculous. You had the big cape on. Then I was like, no video. We're not doing video. It's a goddamn, this is like not that long. This is like six months ago. 
I was like, we're not doing video. Nobody wants to watch. It's a, it's its own fucking art form. It's a radio show. Yeah. And I just was so reluctant to that. And then uh, the YouTube stuff. I, I, I'm such an idiot. And TikTok, I'm still not on TikTok. I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah, I mean, you got to get on TikTok. I know. I just did a podcast with uh, Xiao Ying. Xiao Ying Summers. And she yeah. told you to get on TikTok? She's like, you got to get on there. But yeah, it's, it's, it's ever-changing. And it's scary because young boys like Mitch are just coming up right behind us and they know how to yeah, work this he's stuff. nipping at our heels. And um, it's scary. So let, let's let's take it back. Where are you from? Tell the people where you grew up and yeah. how you ended up at Columbia, for God's sake. Sure, absolutely. Well, I was born here, moved as a baby. In to, Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. Moved as a baby to Portland, Oregon. Wow. Grew up there and then went to New York for college and uh, moved back here like a little over a year ago. Did you grow up in Portland proper? I would say Portland. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Northwest Portland, Portland proper. A little bit out of the city, but you know, right? Not like uh, basically Portland. Yeah. So few people I have ever met in my life are from Oregon. I think you might be the only person from Oregon I've ever met. <laughs> that can't be true at all. That's I mean, a grand statement. To who make. else is from Oregon that I would know? Who are some <sighs> comics from Oregon? Ian Carmel. Ian Carmel. Who I don't know. I know of. You never know. met him. Gosh, people you've met. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Kyle Kinane lives there. Yes. He's not from there. Not from there. You know what? Uh, I mean, there's definitely, like, people from Oregon who are, like, uh, actors, right? I don't know. I know Elk Snout from uh, Overboard. <laughs> who the hell is Elk Over Snout? <laughs> Oh, overboard! It's my high school girlfriend. She's my, my prom date. Elk Snout is um, the the location of the film Overboard. But again, you're ten oh, years younger sure. than me, so okay. this movie means nothing to you. It's just a rape movie to you. <laughs> well, what uh, the guy who did the voice of Bugs Bunny is from Mel Blanc. Mel Blanc went to the my neighborhood high school. Oh so wow! Mel Blanc is kind of like. Mel Blanc is one of the big guys. So when you grew up, did you? Was it a diverse high school? Was it a very liberal high school? I mean, people think of Portland, they sure. think of like you know, extremely progressive. Portland is the whitest big city in America. I don't know if you knew that. It's more. It's whiter than Salt Lake City. So wow. And it's very. I would say the the thing I've kind of been reflecting on because you know my girlfriend is from small town Massachusetts, like me. She's from Seekonk. You know Seekonk. Uh, I, I know of it. I don't know it w intimately, sure. certainly. Yeah, but you've heard of it. Yeah. Surely you've heard of Seekonk. Um, you know, she and I had just such different upbringings by virtue of the fact that, like, the culture in New England is so different than the culture in Oregon. I feel like everyone I know moved to Portland, like, in the 80s or later. Interesting. Right? Like, there's no kind of ingrained sort of, like... You guys all have this thing. I mean, I don't want to speak for all New England, but and by all means, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you guys have this thing of like, oh, well, that's just this classic New England uh, attitude we have or like it's of a New England family or whatever. And there's just none of that in in Oregon. Everything is new. The only, There's like four families who lived there in the 1800s and they're all like lumber people. Right, right. Uh oh, we got lighting issues. Are you freezing, by the way? The air hasn't turned off. Okay, sorry. We're worried. we have an eleven-year-old boy <laughs> yeah. filming us. He's got a big lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> Preacher Lawson. Oh, Preacher Lawson. Preacher Lawson oh, is from uh, Portland. Yeah. I just, oh, okay. I just talked to him. Yeah. He's, oh, I know uh, Preacher. Yeah. Now he's a handsome man. He's handsome, and uh, but I don't think he grew up in Portland, but he was born there. Did you do a Google of comedians from Portland? Yeah. Interesting. Now, when you grew up, were you, because you, again, you seem like an athlete, and you seem, yeah. you're, you're such a handsome boy, you're very smart, and you, you seem quite well adjusted. Thank you. I mean, this compliment city over here, I want to stay in this hotel room forever. That's but, nice. Uh, where, did you, what, what kind of struggles are we talking? Did you have, were you a popular kid? Were you depressed? Because a lot of times, mm -hmm. people, men just keep getting more attractive. So maybe mm. you were just an ugly piece of garbage I in fifth was, grade. I was a little bit of a chubsy wubsy boy. Oh, is that right? Absolutely. Oh Jesus! I'm making fun of how little you eat. <laughs> no, I this mean, is, is this, am, I mean I, am I just? <laughs> you're do, you have, do you have an eating disorder and I'm fucking <laughs> no, you up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I was like a big, I was like a, a bigger kid, and oh, so wow. I, I definitely got made fun of uh, for that. But not, I wasn't. I wouldn't say I was bullied. I would say I was like fairly popular. But I definitely had like body image issues. And the main thing is, I was just as a kid, incredibly anxious. And nervous, like my whole sort of like complex, I think that I gave off from like a early age was like I was very like 
neurotic and nervous all the time. I remember I had a meeting in eighth grade with the guidance counselor and I she went to the bathroom and I looked she had my file and I, oh wow and the I, file. you know you, you ever look at your own file you're not even supposed to your permanent record I don't think so I but I've, I've I recently was given therapy notes from when I was seven from my mother and it's wild. I think I read it on air at one point. I'll find them for you. It's, I'd love to put them up in my home. Oh, it's unbelievable. That, yeah. No. So you looked in the file. I looked in the file, and it just said my name. And then below my name, it just said in big capital letters, oh. history, comma, nervous, exclamation mark. Interesting. Meaning, like, I was distilled to, like, two things. Like, he likes history, so maybe the thing he's good at is history. And then he's nervous. Wow, it interesting. Just, it kind of, it kind of was like the seminal moment for me that like reinforced, you know, this identity of like being an anxious kid. I think. Right. And I played sports. I played basketball, and I really threw myself into that. But you grow up and you realize that sports are kind of pointless. Yeah. Well, Not I don't pointless. know about pointless. Not pointless, but pointless for me. Right, right. I mean, I love sports. I love watching sports, but the idea that I was like, well, I was training all the time for like, for what, you know? But don't you find that, because I was a, a runner in high school, right. and I had, I think we talked about this the other day, I'm like, I had zero stress or anxiety in high school, and I think because I was running seven, eight, nine miles a day, plus yeah. the social aspect of being with everybody, having a commonality, a, a goal, mm. and all that stuff, a coach and discipline. So didn't you think you got a lot of that from there? Because you're obviously a very well-adjusted person. Sports I, helped. I, sports did help me with structure and with discipline, but I do feel that high school and college were the most, which is so weird because I feel like we're a little bit opposite in that way. Mm. Uh they, those were kind of the most anxious times in my life, for sure. I still think I'm kind of an anxious guy, but I mean, nowhere near what I was in in college and then high school, especially. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, yeah, what were you so nervous about as a boy? Honestly, I think I was, I I was I was kind of just like born with like this overly kind of you know <clears throat> I I had my therapist said like years ago like this is like nine years ago ten years ago or something I remember he said like I think that because you are such a big guy and you've always been such a big guy that you as a sensitive person have had a lot of trouble with your body in space and in spaces and so you are so self-conscious about being this like sort of uh, wrecking ball or being this kind of like big guy that like kicks things over and like pushes people and like, you know, grabs and like, you know, throws people against the wall. Now, right. now I'm talking about like a superhero, but like, you know, he was saying you're so conscious of being like this, you know, burly monster that you, your brain like did this switch and it made you so hesitant. And I think, you know, I, I'm kind of one of these guys, like I have my, my posture, I have to really like be conscious of, because right. I'm always hunching over. And I think that is kind of a, a physical representation of my psychology of like, I'm very much trying to, with all of my behavior and the way that I kind of take in the world and the way I interact with the world, like trying to be very delicate. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. That, that that dichotomy causes a lot of anxiety, I feel. Interesting. Now, were your, were your parents anxious people? They were. They were. They were anxious people, but it was one of those things where like – they were very like nervous for stuff on my behalf and like I kind of I don't know if you had this but I kind of like watched them be very panicky about me or about something and like I kind of learned that but when I would be anxious or I would be nervous they would be like oh that's Luke he's quit quit freaking out yes you know what I mean like yes it's well, like you taught me you, I am you of right. course, yes. This I'm is, your cum. This is what um, this is what I've been trying to um, deal with myself a lot with my family because I spend time with my family even still, and they would like, for example, like shame me about my diet. 
Like you eat yeah. nothing and you got to try this and not eat all this food. And I just felt like, and I'm still fucked up about diet because I eat right. seven things and I'm self-conscious, but I feel like an idiot. Right. Guy eats 12,000 calories a day. I know. Well, he eats 300. That's so right. now That's I right. found out you were a, a chubby kid and yeah. I feel terrible. Yeah, totally. But well. uh, I'm just ruining your life. <laughs> oh, but God. Somewhere between the two of us is a healthy diet. But... <laughs> But they would be like, you, you only eat this, you only eat these three things, you never try anything. And now I'm older, and I look back, they eat literally like four, I ate three foods, they ate four. And they think now I'm like like Anthony Bourdain, because like he eats fish, oh right. my God, and I'm like, they, he eats uh, asparagus, this is right. crazy. And they did the same with like, I had to, I learned how to swim late. Mm. I was like, I went to swim lessons, and I didn't want to swim, I was afraid to swim. And, uh, and eventually, it's embarrassing to be at a certain age having to do swim lessons. Yeah, and I was just afraid of the water. Well, to me, it was like as a uh, being a kid is so traumatic. They would like send me to swimming lessons, and I was like, I don't know these people. Who are these people? <laughs> Why am I getting in a water with strangers? This right. is nuts. <laughs> right. But now I realize my parents don't swim. Mm -hmm. Like my father doesn't know how to swim. My mother won't set foot in the ocean and so you look mm. back and i'm like oh you're more anxious than anyone on the planet right and i didn't feel empathized with i just felt shamed for being so anxious and scared and i was considered a, a pussy right. your baby you're crying my father would say save your tears when they matter yada yada and when do they matter exactly and then i've never seen him show any amount of emotion like right so it, it was a, a lot of that stuff it's learned behavior and then shame for the learned behavior that you learned from them that's a, yeah that's a great distillation of it i mean i have felt that because it's like y you guys imprinted this on us right and so why are you shaming why are you telling me like or calling you a pussy or whatever when it's like they they pussified you right in all likelihood yeah exactly i mean like uh Famously in my family, I, I chickened out at Space Mountain. I'm sure I've referenced it on the podcast before. Mm. In 1991, mm. you know, we went to, I was nine and we waited in line to go to Space Mountain. And I was talking all about it. I was all very excited about Space Mountain, the mm -hmm. whole thing. And then when we got there, I had my mother and my aunt who were, were like, you know, bigger ladies. They felt, you feel protected with uh, like a thick mom, sure. you know. And I wanted to sit in between them. So I would feel comforted with sure. these two ladies. And then when, I don't know if you've ever been to Space Mountain, but it's like single file. You're just mm. by yourself. Oh. And so when I got there, I was like, I, I don't want to, keep in mind, I'm nine. Right. A nine-year-old. You're, nine you're not four. But I'm like, I didn't want to sit by myself. I was like, oh, yeah. this is I'm, this is fucked up. I'm, I'm, I don't want to sit here. And so I got so nervous. I was like, I, I, I can't go on there. You got to let me sit with my mother or my aunt. Right. And they were like, that doesn't work that way, you piece of shit. And so I didn't go. I was like, I can't do it. And instead of being met with an amount of empathy, they were just like, oh, that's you t we're going to get back in line, you baby. I just was kind of shamed huh. by my whole family. And they'll still bring it up. They'll still yeah. be like, Space Mountain, this one. Mm. And I'm, I tried to do it as a bit, but it never worked. But I'm like, I've been on a Black Hawk helicopter in Baghdad. <laughs> and I'm like, you guys have never left Massachusetts. <laughs> like, I, I've been on The Tonight Show. And yeah. I'm like, how am I still yeah. getting shamed yeah. for this? I've been on upside down, twirly, whirly roller coasters. Totally. And, uh, you know, I went to Ecuador and Peru and, and yeah. rode a fucking gondola. In a, sure. Uh, but th to them, I'm still like, ah, which I think is also a psychological thing. Your family doesn't want you to change or grow. People don't. Mm. People are threatened by any kind of growth or change. Do you find that? Well, I. It's interesting that and what you had just said about Space Mountain reminded me when I was seven. I we were on vacation in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay Hotel, and that's the been, murder one. Is it? Oh, that is. It's that's yeah. the uh, the fucking what's his toes? Yeah. Yeah. This was sometime before that. But uh, <laughs> was it you? <laughs> I don't want to put myself at the scene of crime here. But, You're a uh, survivor. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, what, how old were you when you went to vacation in Vegas? Seven. Yeah, that's suspect of your parents. Yeah, I was like Mr. Papa Giorgio in Vegas vacation. I had the big red car <laughs> spinning around. You know? I mean, this is, uh, I think it's suspect when parents take their kids. I mean, I don't want to cast aspersions. No, I don't no, know your parents, please, but they're bringing their seven-year-old to Vegas. Now that you now that you say it, I mean, it's uh, really, it's the perfect crime. They're, if they're going to they, go play blackjack. They got know? the hookers doing the, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, this is no place for a boy. You mean, is that burping me? No, they do the uh, the car. You ever been to, you know, in Vegas? They have the card, oh, the yeah, little strip, yeah, they're yeah, outside yeah. going, 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they do that thing. <laughs> I thought you meant that's they give the they have the hookers babysitting. No, no, that's a good uh, idea. Not a bad business. Anyway, so you went to Vegas. Anyway, I went to Vegas and I was in the wave pool at Mandalay Bay. There's a lazy river and a wave pool. And I think both my parents were by the lazy river or near it or something. And I walked into the wave pool by myself, seven years old, slipped, fell. Oh, geez. Hit my head, cracked my skull open. Oh, Christ. And I think that talk about like something happening and then you know, things kind of freezing or wanting you to freeze in place or their behavior changing or them getting more nervous and me getting more nervous. I think that was like a seminal moment of like, oh my God, Luke. I mean, I think I almost died. Like, yeah, it sounds like, I. Uh, I got this big fracture on the back of my skull. And I think at, from that point on, it was very much like I was very careful about everything. They were right. very careful about everything. I, you know, it was kind of almost like a running joke about how careful we were. Right, so, right. Yeah, I think that that kind of maybe has had reverberating. Wow, this is good. I feel very. I feel like I'm really diving into Let's things. Let's get in here. here. We're I mean, on the couch. Is like, this is unbelievable. I also feel like we're we're really kind of digging in to get some of the gunk out. Let's go deep. Yeah, it's like the uh, the way you charge your phone. You got to get a toothpick and get it all out, <laughs> yeah. or else it won't charge. That's true. Metaphor. Bad charger. Um, yeah, it, it's just one of those moments that makes me sort of find a be able to kind of trace a line between then and now and why why I am the way I am, you know? So do you think they were more cautious with you? Afterwards? Oh my God, yeah. Wouldn't you be? Yeah, of course. Well, this is what's scary. I'm about to have a kid myself, and it's right. like you don't want to put all of these fears, and you want to protect the children, uh, your, your kid from these fears, but you also don't want to completely, um, what's that word? Protect them too much. Yeah. Bubbleize them. Totally. What's the yeah. word I'm looking for? Um, insulate them. Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. But I also felt like this was an issue in my family. In my family, I'm still conscious of this around kids. I'm so sensitive to children, I think, from therapy. But, like, so often my family or my friend around his kids will just be like, yeah, did you see the uh, drunk driver kill, hit a bus, mm. killed a family? And I'm like, mm. are we, what are you not? There's, like, a fucking, they're here. These kids are here. Totally. So it's like, why are we putting this idea of children? And I remember thinking that. I, I remember like a definitive moment in my life, my sister, who's four years older than me, reading some like fifth grade paper she wrote. And it was about like, they asked all these questions. She said, biggest fear. And she said, um, like robbers coming into our house. Mm. And I was four years younger. So maybe if she was in, she was 11, I was seven or right. whatever. And I remember thinking that was like a definitive moment where I was like, robbers in our house. Mm. What? I, mm. w I never heard of it. And it was like, I felt like Woody Allen. I was like, deal me out. I don't want, if, if someone can come into my house at some point, right. I don't want to play the game. No house. Just get me out of here. Yeah. I don't, don't want to leave. And, totally. um, and similarly, my, my uncle, who's also four years older than me, I always have to preface that because it's not, a, he wasn't wow. an adult. Yeah. He told me when I was a kid, and I've tried to do this as a bit too, but it's too much of a bummer. He said, uh, every second you get one second closer to dying. Hmm. And I was like a child, and I was just—it just fucking fucked me up. I was trying to like stop time as a yeah. kid. It really, it was like, this is terrifying. Yeah, that. I mean, I remember, I remember having uh, my first sort of—I don't think it was a panic attack because I've since had real panic attacks, and they were just so much different and so much more intense. But I remember having like an anxiety-induced sort of like hysterically sad depressive freak out spell when i was probably eight or nine realizing con like coming to terms with the fact that one day i would die and it would be all over and black and done and yes. now you know in retrospect i'm like that was yeah you're right it is gonna be like that but, right right but i think at the time it's like how do you how do you uh i don't even remember how i how i got out of it i just remember hysterically crying and burying my head into like a pillow like this and being like oh my god what what what's what's the point and but you know you're you're eight years old and you got to go back out and push a, a hoop down a dirt road no I, I i feel the same way and i still get that feeling sometimes oh, yeah, there's moments all the time where i'm like we're all gonna die this is crazy it is crazy but and then you think like oh it's 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 permanent we'll just be dead forever which the fortunate thing is you're not dead forever you're not even a 
it's existing. Nothing. Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. You're, it's there's nothing to fear because well, that's a whole other conversation. But like, there's nothing to really be that. There's the the thing I've come away with is like, I don't. I'm going to be in the moment before I die. Maybe I'll be sad to have it all end. Right. You know. Yeah. The erasure of all of my memories and all of my experiences but you know so the other thing is like so does fucking everyone else so does everyone else and also my boy Thich Nhat Hanh talks about this a lot hey R.I.P. poor one oh, out right. R.I.P. Uh, hey now hey now. Thich Nhat Hanh. <laughs> first hey now he hates it <laughs> <laughs> but Thich Nhat Hanh uh, he talked about what people don't understand is when you contemplate death often you're yeah. sitting here having a nice time we're hanging out and it's like, I don't want to die. But many people, when you get to the point of death, are ready for it. Because uh, oh, you know, yeah, if, there's, if there's an accident, you weren't thinking about it anyway. Totally. But for many of us, you're 88 years old and you've had cancer for the last seven yeah, months. Dude. Totally. And you kind of go, you know what? That's a wrap. My body is aching. So you're in your prime. You're sort of thinking about like death as mm. this thing. But... You've spent years aging and going, you know what? I've served as many people as I can, my children, whatever it is, my right. foot hurts, and I can't think as straight. Right. Count me out. I've done everything that I can do. I have, uh, my grandma died like uh, a month ago. Wow. And she was 97. Jesus, that's a good run. Great, but that, exactly right. Great run. 97. Had that attitude, I would say, for several years leading up to this, but especially in the final few months of like, I'm ready to rock. Right. And that was obviously sad and, you know, painful and intense and it's like any death. But when you have someone who's lucky enough to be able to vocalize that after a hundred years on the planet, it's like, what more can you want? You right. know what I mean? Than to someone being like, we're good here. Like, if you guys are good, I'm good. You know, right, right. it's just kind of like, uh, she was so, uh, I, I don't know if at peace is the right word, but kind of like she was just so ready to go that it's like, wow, if I, if I can get there, right. hopefully it's a, hopefully it's a while. And I certainly don't, I, it's almost like a, a positive thing. Cause you're like, well, I really don't feel that way right now, which must mean that I have a sincere zest for for life and for getting after the day. Yeah, you know? of course. Yeah, it's because life is good. I mean, that's always a positive way to look at it. If you're fearing death, it's because you're enjoying life. Oh, I and love that's, that. That's how I've always felt is like people are like, oh, you're always worried about death. But I'm like, but I love it here. You Fucking love it rules. here. That's the other thing. I'm you, having a nice time. You, you have, I mean, at least from the sample size I have, you... Make the most out of a day. Oh, we we talked you. about that with Derek a little bit. Send this to my wife also. <laughs> well, on the road, I mean, Road Joe makes the, <laughs> you know, you're like a sun up, let's do something. And it's invigorating because most, a lot of comedians especially, like, are kind of, you know, drawing the blinds and like right. hiding from the sunlight and not doing anything until the show. But, you know... We're hiking around. We're on a gondola, for crying out loud. <laughs> yes, which is terrifying. Yeah, that's, yeah, anxiety. We're, you know, eating, cr not crabs, but I was going to say cracking crab claws, but you know what I mean. Like, yeah, yeah. You're, but you're very good at, like, uh, embracing the day, and does that come from a place of fear of death? I think that, and also my greatest fear, and I, it, it's painful to say it so much, but... My greatest fear is like so much of my family, of what I grew up seeing was, and it's why I didn't have a kid until I was 75 years old, <laughs> is that so much of life was like you work and your work sucks, mm -hmm. your job sucks, right. taxes sucks, yeah. your uh, wife sucks, <laughs> your kid sucks. Well. And it was like this, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. it was like. Totally. That was what I was like, Jesus. And so I always had this thought of like, and, and for me, even in school, it was like, we got to write a paper and you got to write this Ugh. thing. I couldn't wait to be like, I'm getting, fuck all that. Yeah. I'm not doing any of that. Yeah. I'm going to get a wife who's cool and I'm not going to have a kid because they ruin your life. Mm. And uh, and I'm going to really live. Because yeah. everyone was like, oh, you got to live to the fullest. So I was yeah. like, all right. Now, it's hurt my career a little bit. I should have been <laughs> filming some of this stuff or listening to sex or writing. Obviously, I've, <laughs> I've made mistakes, clearly. But, no, but you're embracing uh, your, 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 you know, you, tr you travel, right? You vacation. I travel. Every, I, I vacation a lot, more than most. Uh, but I think better. 
to do that than to not vacation. I think so oh, too. You? I, I mean, take what are we talking about here? Yeah, I take a lot of time off and go to a lot of place. I'm a big time off guy, which I always say and I've I've used this uh, analogy many times in the movie Casino where he's like um Joe Pesci's talking about how, how De Niro never enjoyed any of these. He's like, a million times I had to say, we're supposed to be robbing this place, you right. dumb motherfucker. Right. I think he says Jew, whatever. Yeah. But, uh, you know. Uh, but that's how I feel. I'm like, we're supposed to be beating the system. That's why right. I resent so much of the clips and all the content, which I'm now trying to embrace. But Sure. Or at least enjoy it while doing it. But it's like, the whole point of getting into comedy right. is so we didn't have to work all day. Oh, we're supposed to totally. we're supposed to be winning. So totally. these people that are just like running around and, and constantly writing and working and doing podcasts, I'm like, this is nuts. Yeah, as we do a podcast at 4 p.m. Well, but, now, uh, and I, by the way, I'm doing three podcasts today because I'm trying to make up for yeah. lost ground for my son, my sonny boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, man, I think that that's that's true. But you have, I don't know, you're you're you're. Uh, this is going to sound so weird, but I feel like you're you're almost looking at adult life with that experience like through the lens of like how a kid would want to live their adult life right you know what i mean in terms of the zeal and the energy you're hitting it with and i think that that is better than i don't know digging in because you still obviously work hard so it's just like digging in and living a balanced life you'd actually be great for la but you know all right maybe i'll come out here but yeah I think that the road from LA is a nightmare though. It's this tough. It's airport a tough cookie. sucks. Yeah. And the time zone. Burbank. Sucks. Um but I'm going to I'm going to Red Bank, baby. Red Bank, New yeah, Jersey. sure. Come on out. Sure. All Maybe right. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Uncle Luke. <laughs> Uncle Luke. Do you have a name yet? We do. I don't I don't speak of it publicly. Don't speak the name. But a lot of people say that they want it to be Luke List because recently I talked about how I, I want I wish I could be a Luke. It's such a good name. It is a good Luke. name. And there's a ho- professional ho- uh, golfer, Luke List. Named Luke List. Yeah. Wow. Because Luke is a strong name. I want, when I was a, a kid, name. I wanted to be Luke because I was obsessed with Luke Skywalker. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I heard the Luke, I am your father. Prop. That's the one thing. If you have a Luke, you're going to hear Luke, I am your father every single day. I mean, I heard Luke, right. I am your father. Uh, yeah. M- more more often than not. Wow. I didn't even think of that. Oh, yeah. Any I mean, name you have, it's, you know. Well, what'd you have? Shoeless Joe Jackson? <laughs> nah, Joe. Joe Blow. Joe, Joe Blow. Blow me, you fucking loser. Yeah. <laughs> Average Joe. Joey Bag of Donuts. Joey Bag of Donuts. Well, I had lists, so it was all, you're on the list, Schindler's yeah. List, list, whatever the oh, fuck. Oh, totally. I, I mean, I, my last name is Monus, and it's spelled like Moans, and so I, I mean, that was just, that was a toughie. I had a... I had a, people write on my car one time, like spray paint my car. Oh, Luke geez. Moans, M O A N Z. Oh, geez. Yeah. Well, by the way, I mean, <laughs> it sounds like I'm being hazed and great, but it was like, it was girls and they were kind of, you know, they were. They were into you. Maybe they you were, were into me. I'm, I'm not sure. Now that I think back, they probably were into me and I took everything like a slight and I was like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> it, that's that, the, oh. the biggest regrets of my life. Are you going to say this? Is, yes, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I mean, I look back. I had, I don't know what happened to me, but like z- less than zero self esteem. Yep. And I look back through, I was just doing this recently. I talked about it somewhere. I was like looking through photos of old comedy, Boston comedy days. And there's this woman who was beautiful, literally sitting on my lap, <laughs> like at a party like this. And she's kissing me on the cheek. And I'm mm. like drunk like this. And like Sarah's like, oh, is this you hooked up with this girl? And I was like, no, what the fuck was going <laughs> like I, yeah. a, a human being sitting who's chosen to sit on my lap, I know. like laying across me and like, let's take a photo. I'm kissing his face. Right. And I didn't pick up on like, oh, maybe this woman might want to have she's sex interest- with me. She's interested in you. Ridiculous. Yeah. I think it is sort of the pr- uh, profound sadness of most adult uh, adults in men and women, like in modern society, at least in America, that their child and teen selves and early 20 selves have no self-esteem and you every single person you talk to if you on the street you walk around every single person you talk to they all want to go back and they want to grab that you know 17 year old joe or 22 year old luke by the shoulders and be like you're okay. Don't worry about right. it. It's okay. It's fuck this woman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go have sex and don't don't do homework and uh, you know just go go be yourself and 
that's that's enough you know i, I was just saying that we might have said this this past weekend where i'm like i'm hanging with my niece and nephew and and uh yeah i think it was you i was talking to like Athletic. I was always a good athlete, but I just had no confidence. And it's like, mm. I wish I could go back to Little League and be like, everyone's shitting their pants. Right. Like, you think yeah. you're the only... I really thought, I'm the only nervous one here. Everybody yeah. knows what they're doing. I'm nervous, and I would be good if I wasn't so nervous. And that's what happens with comedy. That's when it's like, you can explode um, creatively. Because right. you have this confidence of like, wait a minute. No, no, no. I'm good. Right. And I can do well here. It doesn't matter. And right. uh, going back to uh, real quick, the I tried to do this as a bit, never worked. But the women thing too. There was this woman that I ended up uh, making love to later. But we um, went to the New York Film Academy together. It was like a five week acting program, and I had like such a crush on her. But she had this boyfriend, and she would kind of like reference him, but he was never around. They never talked, and she was mm. like, "Oh yeah, whatever." And our, our mutual friend was like, "If she didn't have a boyfriend, you guys would be together. You're meant for each other." Mm. And this guy never appeared anywhere. She never talked highly of him. She would just kind of be like, oh, yeah, this guy. And then, like, the last day, we went and saw Lost in Translation together. Mm, 2003. Is, yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, great film. And uh, at the end, we, we finished the movie, and we both loved it. We were like, that was great. Just loved each other. Yeah. And she goes, I was so happy they kissed at the end. And I went, me too. All right. I'll see you later. And I just took off. And looking back, I'm like, oh, I should have planted one on this bitch. Oh, yeah. It was just so stupid. And then, like, even, like, a month later, I, she was like, you got to, she had an apartment in New York. She was like, come down and stay. And oh. um, I stayed with her. I just, like, slept on the couch because I was like, well, you got your boyfriend, whatever. It was horrible. And eventually we, we, we made, but even then it was like, it was too late. But, Yeah. The one that got away. And, and now we're both happily married with children and all that stuff. Sure, but it's, you know, that is entirely a thing of, like, she was presenting to you that she was interested and your own self-esteem or lack thereof got in the way. Completely. And that is a, I feel like, such a universal thing of, like, you know, I, I can remember even with Alyssa, who I've been with for a hundred years, I remember when we first got together, like she was very generous in the sense that she like gave me a few chances because I had a few of those nights in sequence with her where I was just like not picking up and she yeah. would be like, Hey, will you walk me from the bar to the train station? I was like, well, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> I had the same thing with Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Same thing. It's brutal. And, and then she's kind of like, okay. And then, you know, she always tells this story, but like, the night that we ended up having our first kiss, she's like, hey, why don't you come meet me at this blah, blah, blah bar in Brooklyn? And I was like, sure. And then I like invited my buddy, Julian. I was just like, hey, Julian, he's going to tag along too. And she was like, what? And like, oh. I just, I show up with this guy, Julian. He's like, he's the life of the party. He's a great guy. But she was like, why? She was, Later on, she was like, why the fuck did you bring Julian? Like, we were trying, you know, we were trying to get something going there, and like I'm like, hey, just, this guy's buying shots. Come on, everybody! It's so brutal. I had the same exact thing with Sarah, like friends and uh, walking around all the time. And my birthday, she got me a card that says like, if you ever want to hang, like I'm two blocks away, we can hang. And I was like, oh, okay, great. And then I, I would same thing, walk her home, be like, okay, take yeah. care, pat her on the head. <laughs> and then uh, the last, the, the, the Finally, like, she was just like, okay, this guy's gay or not into me, right. whatever. Right. And so then, like, we would just be, f we were friends. And then, like, a couple times she was, like, t hanging with, like, we'd hang with Nikki Glaser and they would talk about boys, whatever. Uh -huh. And I had to be like, hey, I, I can't really be friends with you because I'm like, I kind of have, like, feelings for you, I think. And and she was like, oh, okay. And then even then I was like, so see you later. <laughs> and then one time she was like, do you want to come over? So we didn't talk for a while. She was like, do you want to come over and hang out and watch a movie or something? So yeah. I came over. And we watched Nirvana Unplugged in her bed. And we watched the entire concert, like an hour long thing. And I still hadn't made a move. Like literally we're laying in bed, but I was still like, I don't know. And it's it's all fear of rejection is what totally. it is. Totally. You just don't want somebody to be like, oh, you fucking <sighs> oh, dude, loser. Yeah, I mean, because I, I mean, I, I had, you know, there were girls who I dated, obviously, in high school. Not obviously, but I gr dated girls in high school and college. But I also had moments of, like, in high school, like, like a movie where I was, like, you know, tried, you know, went in for the kiss or said whatever. Yeah. And then, 
they're like, oh no, we're we're friends. And yeah, I was like, yeah. Oh, okay, of course we're friends. We'll, we'll always be friends. I'm you're you know that's I what it is. So afraid of that, I just couldn't do it. It was the same with sports, and I, I think we might have talked about this the other day. I was like, I remember playing basketball before high school, well, middle school, and I and I was pretty good. Mm-hmm. You know, I was very good, but I, on the court, I just didn't wasn't great, and the the coaches refed the other team's games mm-hmm. so like if you're a coach you coach your game and then you stick around and you ref the next game so all the and this guy mr greenlaw who i'm grateful for he was like a coach of a different team he was refing our game and he pulled me aside and he was like joe i want to see you take over this game mm-hmm. he's like you're taller than everybody out here just take mm-hmm. over just mm-hmm. take the ball and go right to the hoop mm-hmm. and that's what my coach should have been saying and it was a moment of like Oh wow! You think I like he was just like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. Like I'm watching you play. I can see that you can, yeah. but some of it too is like this. You want to be nice. You don't want to. You feel like guilt in beating somebody or whatever. I mean, that's what I'm talking about with my my big my big guy thing. Yeah, like, I think I probably played basketball in a soft way because of that exact complex of like, right. you know, not. You know, it's not killer instinct, but it's like not embracing. Like I could never play football, for example. Right. I don't think I would even. I I, I would because of contact and like oh I don't want to hurt anybody. It's funny I, I did you know MMA for a couple years and, uh, and and hope to go back. But Diego Lopez, past guest, my trainer. I thought you were gonna say passed away. <laughs> no, no, Diego Lopez dead, was dead. choked to death in the gym. <laughs> yeah, by you. Um, they didn't tap, so I yeah. killed him. Uh, but. He, um, we sparred many times and, uh, you know, he's obviously just dominates. I'm a yeah. fucking, he's a cage fighting MMA instructor. Sure. And, uh, one time ever he threw a punch and I don't know how I just countered and I caught him like pretty good. And I immediately was like, Oh, sorry, sorry. And he was like, what, what are you doing? Like, so I'm like, this is not the sport for me. Like, here's a man who's literally beating the shit out of me. Right. And I threw a punch and it landed. And I, my immediate instinct is like, oh, fuck, my bad. Yeah. So you're like, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm a big puss. I don't want to hurt anybody. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine. Well, but I mean, you were doing it to, to train. You were doing it to, for exercise. Yeah, yeah. Right. But I even mean, still, like the sure. feeling of connecting in someone's face it was like immediately like oh jesus of course and i've had dreams like that where like it comes down to like a, a screen match and then i fucking like just blast somebody and uh, i had an incident like this and i just hurt them so bad that everyone's like you piece of shit yeah <laughs> and i had this happen in uh on 14th street and second avenue in the city sarah and i were walking east village and there was this drunk older guy just like hammered like Ugh. And he was just walking like a zombie, and he started walking towards us. It was kind of like Pedro and Don Zimmer, if you remember that brawl. He started coming towards us, and I just stepped aside and, like, threw him. And he went, like, flying into the street, and his glasses went flying. And it really, like, skidded across the street. Wow. And all these people came running over to help him, like, oh, my God. Yeah. And I felt like, oh, Jesus, I felt like, like you were saying, I felt like fucking He-Man. I was going to, this sounds like when uh, Clark Kent discovers he's Superman by, like, throwing a bus or something. <laughs> That's what it felt like. You're a monster. Like, to everyone else, I just whipped an old man into yeah. the street. And I'm like, I swear to God, he was, like, coming at us. And sure. I, think, I, I think Sarah was like, oh, that was hot. But... Because yeah. he kind of was like zombie Jim Morrison, like yeah. walking right at us. Yeah. So I just, you know, gave him a good. You picked him up with one hand, and threw him across the I, street. I spun him on my <laughs> yeah. hand. Yeah. Um, Super but strength. Similarly, that feeling of like, oh fuck, I just, I'm a piece of shit. I know, and I feel like that has kind of reverberated, at least in my, I don't know. I feel like that feeling of self consciousness has reverberated in my life for sure. Yeah. You know of not wanting to step on toes or whatever. I feel that way in comedy too. Obviously you carry this stuff with you. It's like part of it is like the self-esteem thing of like, I can't like be the most successful. Like Mm. I I don't want to, I gotta, what am Mm. I going to do? Totally. I can't be fucking Bill Burr or Louie. That's crazy. I'm like this kind of guy. And I've always felt that way. Even going back to like the beginning of my career, I kept featuring for so long and I would see these guys be like, no, no, you got to stop. Like Sam Morrill, who's several years younger than me, this is like years and years ago. He's like, no, no, I stopped featuring. I don't do that. And I remember being like, what? How did? Yeah. How did you decide that? You're just yeah. telling people that because yeah. I was always afraid I'll never work again. Right. People would just go, then he's out. Right. But certain people just have the ability to be like, no, no, I'm headlining. I'm trying to get 
like even I, you hear people be like, I want to do Carnegie Hall, and I'm like, right. Carnegie Hall, right? I'm trying to get past the New York Comedy Club. I never had any goals, <laughs> right? Yeah, I hate myself. No, I mean, I definitely relate to that. I feel like the fear of, at least in comedy, which is all I can speak to, the fear of success, which is, is kind of a strange concept, but it is a lot stronger than the fear of failure. Because you're talking about the fear of rejection with certain personal life stuff. But then I think the fear of success is maybe like the fear of risk taking or the fear of putting yourself out there. Right. And like comedy is already such a... Uh, art form of like laying yourself bare and like really kind of I mean it's the it's sort of the ultimate pr putting yourself out there you right, know, right. Like it's just you, you being vulnerable and you chancing the idea that you'll humiliate yourself basically every single night yeah, for yeah. money I mean it's crazy but um, you know I think that People get afraid on top if, if extra things are added to that. If you already, it's like you have the gall to do stand up comedy and you have the gall to say, I want to perform at Madison Square Garden. It's like, how dare you? Right, you know? right. I always, I think I said this to you, but I, I always felt like there were two types of comics. There were the kind of comics who their first show or their second show was like a bringer with like 500 people who they knew. Mm -hmm. Or then there were the people who like, like, I think I'm in this camp who started comedy. I didn't really tell anybody. Right. I kind of did it in secret. Yeah, I did it with same. like a lot of shame and like, you know, I would like, you know, go to open mics with like an alias, you know, <laughs> George Glass, you know, <laughs> things like that. That's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, I was more that certainly. I mean, I went, my uncle came with me but and I definitely different. didn't tell my parents. That's different. I think that you so, having a buddy come with you and having moral support, I think is one right, thing, but right. I'm talking about like. You, you know, you hear about people who will not be named, but like, you know, like they're like, oh, yeah, my first time doing stand up was like I I rented out the local comedy club. Right, right, and I right. just did an hour and killed. And yeah. from then on, I knew I was the man. And it's like, well, what? I can't imagine doing that. Comedy is also so scary not to like I hate when comics like blow comedians like we're <laughs> heroes, but it is the art form that is closest to just you. Yes, like a painting, it's a it, it, the, the painting is the art, right? And a band, you're playing music and you're with other people. A comedian, if like if they don't like you, they don't like you. Oh god, they're like I dislike your you as an entity, as yeah. a human being, because you're presenting yourself. You're like here I am. Right. There is no. You're not acting. It's so immediate too. There's no no time for anyone to kind of chew on it. Like, well, maybe I like him. I don't know. Yeah. It's either they're laughing or they're not laughing, and. You just have to kind of deal with that. Yeah, and it's it, that's the stuff that makes me. We got to wrap up here in a okay. moment, but that's the stuff that makes me feel really good. Is that for all the fear and anxiety I've had in my life, like yeah. I still went and pursued comedy and succeeded. Yeah. And you which made is, it, yeah, yeah, which is uh, very um, long odds. So we're we're very extremely courageous people. I, we really are, and I really like okay. what you said when we were in Spokane, which was, it's crazy that. Because uh, we were in the green room and you were like, isn't it crazy that it, we were with the the MC for the weekend, Quinn, who's a new comic, yeah. newer comic. I think he's been doing it four years. And you're like, isn't it crazy that we all just said we wanted to be a comedian? You walked into a comedy club one day and yeah. and now you're here. You know, it's wild. It's, it is it is wild to show up and be like, I'd like to be a comedian, please. Which is like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, truly start yeah. at the bottom. Like you're literally there is nobody lower than you. Yeah, and you start by identifying as the as the job. Like that's like you say you're a comedian and you're a comedian. And that's yeah. kind of that's all it has to be. Yeah, it's a self diagnosed disease. It's <laughs> like alcoholism. But that's uh, right. Uh well look, thanks for having me. We're we're just under fifty right. what a what a pro for God's sakes. Yeah. I'll have uh -huh. to have you should come back on and do it. We'll, we Let's we didn't even it. get into a lot of stuff. I know childhood. I feel like I but I really felt like I was kinda beginning to uh dig in there, you know. I'm glad we got to we got to do it again. And uh, thanks for having me. Mitch never hit record, but uh, where where can they find you? Tell them where your uh, stuff is. I'm at Luke Monis M O N E S on everything, and uh, I have an album out called Happening in My Head that's everywhere, and you can get it on the audio. Yeah, hilarious guy, and uh, you know where to find me. Subscribe to this YouTube if you're watching it on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Tell some friends about the podcast. Spread it around. Say here's one of the best episodes. Check out Luke and uh, check out my dates comedianjoelist.com. And thanks for Mitch being on the ones and Thank twos. Thank you, Mitch. Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Thank you.